Good morning, KU. Welcome back to Good Morning KU Sports. We've got a stack show this week for you, starting off with Ryan going into a preview on MLB spring training this year, followed by Luke going through some wild Super Bowl highlights this year. And then we got some new yet the same with Eli and Emmett doing some college basketball and NHL pick em today. We'll have Owen walk us through a preview of KU versus Oklahoma, followed by Katie talking some good old-fashioned March Madness. Lily will have some things to say about KU softball. Finally, we'll end the show with our iconic sports weather segment with Sam. We'll have some breaks in between, like now. start off our show, let's jump right into our MLB spring training preview with Ryan. Thanks Cole, appreciate it. As winter turns into spring, that can only mean one thing. The boys of summer are back and ready for action. As pitchers and catchers report for spring training, it's time to look forward to the upcoming Major League Baseball season. There are many storylines heading into the season, and the biggest one takes us to Camelback Ranch, the spring training home of the Dodgers. The Dodgers won the offseason, and to say anything less will be staggering. They spent more than $1 billion on Shohei Otani and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. They signed many notable players, including Tyler Glasnow and Teoscar Hernandez. On paper, this is by far the best team in the major leagues, and it's not even close. Now, the only reason I emphasize just how good the Dodgers are is because when it comes to October baseball, this team just can't seem to figure it out. There's the Dodgers losing to the Padres in 2021. Losing in the divisional round the past two years to NL West opponent stings. It's another World Series or bust year for this ball club, as it has been for the past five or so seasons. So this year, can the Dodgers finally put it all together and win their second ring in the past 10 years? Now, it's hard to talk about spring training in this part of the country without talking about the Royals. And it's hard to talk about the Royals without mentioning Bobby Witt Jr. What can the kid not do? Last season, he became the first Royals member of the 30-30 club. He is silky smooth at shortstop, as you see there, and he is the future of the club and one of the brightest young stars in the game. With all that said, the Royals had one of their worst seasons in 50-plus years as a franchise. The root cause of it? Pitching. That's why general manager J.J. Piccolo signed two starting pitchers in Seth Lugo and Michael Waka, as well as relievers Will Smith and Chris Stratton. These guys know how to command their stuff and throw strikes. Plain and simple. Power hitter Hunter Renfro was also signed to the team as a much needed power presence that was missing last year. Now to the defending champs, the Texas Rangers. A team with many ups and downs last year, but you have to imagine they were pretty happy the way their season ended with that World Series winner right there. When it comes to this past offseason though, one can only describe it as a loss. They made no key additions, but instead lost a pitcher in Jordan Montgomery who was a key contributor down the stretch to get the Rangers their first ever ring in franchise history. The bright spot for the Rangers though? They return all six of their All-Stars for this upcoming season. The biggest name out of those is shortstop Corey Seager. Though he underwent left sports hernia surgery on January 30th, the team says he could be ready for play by opening day. What's standing in a Rangers way of being back-to-back -back World Series winners? Something a team hasn't done since the Yankees won the World Series from 1998 to 2000? It's the pitching. Cy Young winners Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer could return to the rotation around the trade deadline, but until then, it's up to starting pitching rotation led by All-Star Nathan Avaldi and a bullpen that is nothing much to write home about. Scott Boris, a name many baseball fans have heard plenty of times, arguably the most well-known and powerful sports agent in America and possibly the world, he is no stranger to drawing the ire of fans during free agency. His approach is one that is nice and slow in order to try and get his clients the largest sum of money possible. His four biggest clients that still not have signed are Blake Snell, Cody Bellinger, Matt Chapman, and Jordan Montgomery. These are star players who can really help a team through the grind that is an MLB season. It will be intriguing to see how their respective free agency periods play out and just how much they help whatever team they sign with. From Juan Soto and the revamped Yankees to a young and talented Baltimore Orioles team, it will sure be fun to see how this upcoming Major League Baseball season plays out. I hope you can join me in saying baseball is back. Thanks, Ryan. Now we're going to pivot our way over to Luke with some highlights from this Las Vegas Super Bowl. Luke, what happened in the big game? Yeah, thanks, Cole. Um, it was a crazy and unconventional Super Bowl, to say the least. Um, let's look at some of the highlights from the big game on Sunday. 
So after coming back from yet another 10 point deficit in the Super Bowl, the Chiefs have now won their second in a row and third in the Patrick Mahomes era. To get things started, the first half was really not that exciting with sloppy offense from both teams and like seven team who adds during the breaks, which was just really making it a rough watch. And um, there were still a few moments in there, including the Juwan Jennings touchdown pass to Christian McCaffrey. It really looked like it was going to end up being picked off, but it ended up going all the way. And I think if the 49ers were to win that game, uh, Juwan Jennings had a real shot at MVP for the huge performance that he put up. After this, Mahomes then answered this with a huge 52-yard pass to McCole Hardman, but Pacheco ended up fumbling the ball on the next play, which most likely saved a touchdown. Another was Jake Moody's 55-yard field goal that broke the Super Bowl record for longest field goal, just to be beat by Harrison Butker when he hit a 57-yard one in the third quarter. Going into the second half, things did not start well for the Chiefs with an interception on just the third play of the drive. After this, it was just a real big defensive battle from both teams, and this was until the Chiefs' special teams came up huge when a punt hit the heel of 49ers player Lutter Jr., giving them the ball on just the 15-yard line where Valdez Scantling would receive a touchdown pass the very next play. The 49ers then answered back with a touchdown, but the extra point was blocked, leaving the game within a field goal and being one of the main reasons the Chiefs would stay in the game and come back. The rest of regulation was just a battle of field goals and tough defense, um, eventually leading to overtime. And then once overtime started, the 49ers won the coin toss and chose to receive the ball, which shocked many as the new rules state that both teams get a chance to possess the ball no matter what. And after being held to just a field goal with their possession, Patrick Mahomes knew all he had to do was run back on that football field and score a touchdown to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And, I mean, that's exactly what he did because he's Patrick Mahomes. And after slowly marching down the field with a couple of big rushes from him, they were on the three-yard line, and McCall Hardman would come up big again, running to the outside and hauling in the game-winning touchdown pass to prove that this team is the next dynasty. And Chiefs fan or not, I mean, you have to admit, this game ended up being one of the most entertaining and exciting Super Bowls we have had in recent years. And I can't wait to see what next year brings. Thank you, Luke. Even though the Chiefs won, all of us here at Good Morning KU Sports are thinking about those who were impacted after the Kansas City Parade. Right after a quick break, we'll hop right back into some NFL Pick'em with Greenwald. the bus again yeah you should download my bus Lawrence you can see when buses are arriving here and you can also see where the buses are in Lawrence wow okay download the my bus Lawrence app today hello and welcome back to another episode of picking with Greenwald I'm Eli Greenwald with me today is Emmett Swenside um, now that the NFL season is officially over with the Kansas City Chiefs being crowned Super Bowl champions our picks will segue over to NHL, NBA, MLB, when the regular season gets going, and college basketball. Uh, this week we have a college basketball game and two NHL games as it's the Stadium Series games in MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. For those of you who don't know, my name is Emmett. I'm super excited to be back or to be on my first segment of Picking with Greenwald. And I'm ready to talk some college basketball and NHL. about you, Eli? Yeah, let's get right into the picks. I'm excited. Right? Awesome. All right, first game we got, uh, we got the number four seed Marquette at... Uh, in UConn against the number one overall team. That'll be, this game, I mean. that'll be a huge game. And I don't know if you knew, but I was a guard growing up. I'm excited to see this elite guard matchup in Tristan Newton versus Tyler Kolek. I think they're both great at what they do, um, passing, scoring, especially in Tristan Newton. And that is why I'm taking UConn here. Overall, really solid team. They got Stephon Castle putting up 12 a game. They got Donovan Klingon, a 6'10 big, putting up 10. And, I mean, I've been talking about Newton. 15 points a game on 40% shooting. I think they're too much for uh, Marquette, especially being in Connecticut. But I would not count out Shaka Smart squad. Yeah, you like Marquette, uh, or you like UConn, excuse me. I'm going to go the other direction and pick Marquette. Uh, a lot of people do not think this is going to be the outcome. A lot of people are expecting a blowout from UConn, the number one overall team. Um, they have been on fire all season long. I think this is going to be a lot more competitive than people think. I actually think Marquette is going to, I, if I were to pick March Madness bracket today, obviously we've still got time, but if I were to pick it today, I would, I would think that Mar Marquette is going, is, would win the national championship. I think Shaka Smart's one of the best coaches in college basketball. 
I think Marquette is it's in, in very, very good. I think people are underrating them because the Big East might not be the most competitive conference. Um, they just defeated Butler 78-72 in Hinkle Fieldhouse um, in Indianapolis, which is a tough place to win in. Um, Tyler Kolek, Marquette's freshman guard, is becoming one of the best, one of the best players in college basketball. Um, and I think that Marquette and UConn are a lot more closely matched than people think. Field goal percentage-wise, which in my opinion is the most important stat in college basketball, Mar UConn shooting 49%, whereas UConn shooting 49%, where Marquette's shooting 47 So, I like Marquette. And then we're going to switch over to the NHL. Flyers versus Devils in New Jersey at MetLife Stadium. I got the Flyers, and they've been underdogs all season. Uh, no one expected them to perform the way they are, and safe to say, they're third in the Metropolitan Division. And I think the biggest X factor is Travis Konecki. I mean, he's got 49 points, 25 goals, 24 assists. He's been outstanding this year. They're hot right now, four of the last five. I think the Flyers are going to be too much for the Devils. I think it's going to be a good game. Stadium Series games are always exciting. Outside, I'm going to go with the Devils. Um, it's, I mean, MetLife Stadium in New Jersey is kind of a home game for the Devils when you think about it. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of Devils fans in attendance. Um, and New Jersey needs to start winning. I mean, they need to start winning games. They're two games out of the wild card, of a wild card spot, and they need to start picking things up since the All-Star break. Um, since the All-Star break, New Jersey has really picked it up. They have, this might not sound like a lot, but their goals per game have increased one point on average one and a half might not sound like a lot like i said but that that's is big. a huge that's number big. that's a huge big. number they also get their good in their goalie back vtech vanasek from injured reserve that's going to be a huge get jack hughes New jersey's best player three points in the last two games he's starting to find his groove um and he including one of the best goals i've seen all season in a spectacular goal against seattle so i like the devils in this game another stadium series game subway game Rangers, Islanders, the two New York teams at MetLife Stadium. Who do you like for this one, Emmett? This one will be fun to watch. I actually have the Rangers. Um, they're on a big win streak right now. They're arguably one of the best teams in the league, undoubtedly. They have been spectacular this season. They're actually 4-0 in NHL's outdoor games. I think that's a big, big thing to point out, um, that they're comfortable playing outside. All Everything can happen. They're good. Um, I'm also really liking what I'm seeing out of Artemi Panarin. Uh, he's been spectacular. And going into the Islanders, they're on a two-game losing streak. They've been really rocky. I don't like their production, but the one person I do like for them is their goalie, Igor uh, Shostekin. He's been phenomenal. Um, he actually had a shutout last game. I think he'll be a big play for them, but Rangers are taking this one home for me. Yeah. I agree with you on the Rangers. Um, I think that it's, it's always a good game when these two teams play each other. Um, especially outside. It's going to be quite the atmosphere. It's going to be exciting. Um, Artemi Panarin, like you said, has been spectacular. I think he's, he's the MVP frontrunner right now. Um, I think that the Rangers, in my opinion, are the best team in the NHL. They have the fourth best record in the league. I think that the, my early prediction is they're going to win the Stanley Cup. Like I said, early prediction. But against the mediocre Islanders team, you got Matt Barzell, but after that it kind of falls off. And like you said about Igor Shosturkin, for the Rangers, he has been on fire recently, coming off a shutout against Calgary when they won two nothing. His first shutout of the year, he recorded 30 saves, which so he's starting to find his groove. One of the best goals in the NHL, yeah. And I think it's gonna be an exciting game to watch. This will be it'll close. Be, it'll be fun to see. It's outdoor game. Perfect. Always, always. Okay. All right, that's all we have for uh, picking with Greenwald today. Emmett, thanks for joining me. And after a short break, we'll be back with Owen, who'll be giving us a look into what KU's matchup against Oklahoma this weekend will look like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I always just clap in the start. This is where everyone's talking amongst themselves. Do you know how to do it? Do you know how to do it? Are we supposed to smile? When do we start? Somebody over here already started. Can we talk about how the piccolo part is the most complicated one? It is. <laughs> if you listen, you're doing it when the band's not playing. You have to tell me when it starts. I still don't know. Here we go.
it has a right and a wrong way of doing it. <laughs> no, no, yeah. wrong. I like my way better. I don't know how One, to do two, the three, end. Four. It's just I don't Sorry. know the head. All right, welcome back everyone. Kansas men's basketball is heading to Norman tomorrow to take on the 25th ranked Oklahoma Sooners, and this is looking to be a big matchup in the Big 12. The Jayhawks are coming off their toughest loss of the season, losing at Texas Tech 79 to 50 in a game where KJ Adams and Hunter Dickinson shot a combined three for 22 from the field. And coach Bill Self was ejected after mouthing off at an official. However, Kevin McCuller and Jamari McDowell were both out, McCuller dealing with a knee injury and McDowell fighting through an illness. Dewan Harris played through an ankle injury he sustained last Saturday against Baylor, but he was relatively ineffective, shooting two for eight with three turnovers. Looking forward to tomorrow's matchup, KU is looking to pick up their first road win since beating an anemic Oklahoma State team in Stillwater on January 16th. The Jayhawks have struggled mightily on the road, going two and five when playing outside Allen Fieldhouse this year. About the availability of Kevin McCuller and Jamari McDowell, Coach Self said on Wednesday, quote, Jamari shouldn't be an issue at all, and depending on how Kevin feels through practice on Thursday and if he's able to go on Friday, I would anticipate him being out there some. Self continued on to say that if McCuller is available to go, he doesn't know how much he would play. As for the Sooners, they're coming off a loss against number 12 Baylor, a team KU beat just last week. They surrendered 12 turnovers and allowed the Bears to shoot 54% from the field in the 79-62 route. They're dealing with their fair share of injuries as well, with John Hugley and Rivaldo Soares both being questionable for tomorrow's game. It's also important to mention that KU beat Oklahoma earlier this season at home, 78-66. The Jayhawks tip off at 3 p.m. tomorrow on ESPN. Back to you, Cole. Thanks, Owen. Now I'm curious what Katie has to say about if March Madness started right now. Katie, what's been up with college basketball? Thanks, Cole. With the Super Bowl over, we can now turn our attention to the best three weeks in all of sports. That's right, it's time for March Madness. So before you challenge your friends and family in a tournament group and brag about how this is the year you finally get that perfect bracket, let's break down the top projected seeds where the Jayhawks are projected to land and some great storylines for teams on the bubble. With 32 days to go until Selection Sunday, so much is still up in the air. But one thing is for certain, UConn Huskies look like the number one team in all of college basketball. The reigning national champion Huskies have won 14 out of 15 games since losing 69-65 in Allen Fieldhouse back in December. UConn is 23-2 overall and have eight players that average more than five points a game. Also joining UConn on the projected one seed line are Purdue, Arizona, and Houston, which is notable because out of the last 38 national champions, 24 have been one seeds. We all love Cinderella stories, but those one seeds are typically dominant in March, so keep that in mind when filling out your bracket. As for where KU is projected to land, after a tough few weeks on the road, Bill Self's squad has dropped down to about the two or three seed line. Bracketologists have interesting takes on the Jayhawks, considering Kansas has some of the best wins in the country over aforementioned UConn and Houston, alongside wins over Baylor, Kentucky, and Tennessee, but tough losses on the road versus West Virginia, UCF, and that recent 29-point drubbing at Texas Tech. But with Kansas getting healthier and Bill Self on the sideline, you can never count out the Jayhawks in the tournament, and I think another classic Kansas run to a Final Four is in the cards. So which team should be nervous on Selection Sunday? As of right now, longtime West Coast powerhouse Gonzaga has had a disappointing season. ESPN reporter Joe Lenardi has the Bulldogs as one of his first four teams out of the tournament right now. Gonzaga has made 24 straight NCAA tournaments, and this would be a major storyline if Mark Few's team missed the tournament. On the other side of the bubble, Lenardi lists the Nebraska Cornhuskers as his last team in the tournament. The Cornhuskers, long seen as a non-threat in the Big 12, have had an incredible season, knocking off Purdue. This would be Nebraska's first win in the NCAA tournament in a decade, and fans in Lincoln have a lot to be excited about. So get ready to fill out your bracket, have it promptly busted within the first couple hours of the tournament, watch some incredible upsets and buzzer beaters, and most importantly, have a great time watching the tournament. Thanks, Katie. Now we have two more segments with the break in between. Let's start with Lily and see what's going on with some KU softball. Thanks, Cole. I'm excited to watch some Jayhawk softball this year, and if you are too, you came to the right place and time. The softball team is headed to Florida to complete compete in the spring games. Not any spring game, the spring games. And it sounds like a huge deal for the Jayhawks. 
They competed on the 15th, will compete today, and will compete on the 17th, making for a fun weekend watching softball for all my softball lovers out there. These games will be great for the team to get in shape before going head-to-head -head with four Big Ten opponents, including Penn State, who was revving up and getting ranked for the season, and to get back on track after the loss to USF on Monday. This team has some standout names to keep an eye out for, including their loved sophomore trio of Haley Kripe, Presley Limbo, and Ainsley Lindov, who are taking over for KU's offense. KU softball also has eight seniors on the team, with five of those athletes getting regular minutes, making for some experienced players who can lead this team to a great season. From the start of the spring games, the Jayhawks faced off in back-to-back -back games against USC Riverside and Coastal Carolina yesterday. The Jayhawks dropped the game against UC Riverside, but beat Coastal Carolina 4-1, meaning they went 1-1 one one in games yesterday. The Jayhawks will take on Penn State at 1 o'clock this afternoon, which can be seen on Flow Sports. Penn State has won all five of their games so far this season, including 3-2 win over Arkansas. The Razorbacks are known to be a great softball team, so Penn State win might shake things up for them for the season. Penn State also has defeated Marshall, Florida Atlantic, and Ohio. We will see if the Hawks can beat their winning streak. The women will also take on Illinois this, at 3.30 this afternoon after their Penn State game. The Lini are 2-3, and three, being defeated by Auburn, Texas, and Tennessee. Ouch. Regarding the loss on Monday, it takes the Jayhawks to a 3-2-1 record, with the tie occurring to a, quote, drop-dead rule enforced by a travel curfew. The Jayhawks will be playing five teams between the 15th and the 17th, so this record could really go either way. If confidence was a matter of issue, the game against the, against the University of Central Arkansas on February 10th was the game to light a fire underneath them. They beat the Bears after losing them to them in Lawrence 13-0. Must have felt good to beat them after getting beat and shut out at home. I'm excited to see where this season will take the softball team as it looks as they still need to get comfortable for the season. See how angry students get when you leave your laundry in the washer or dryer without setting a timer? Don't be that guy. To help resolve this issue, contact housing at ku.edu. Welcome back to Good Morning KU Sports Weather. And I tell you, it's a cliche to say this here in Kansas, but what a difference 48 hours can make. On Wednesday, it was high 60s and sunny and beautiful, whereas now it is 30 degrees and we've had snow falling for the past about three hours now. And there was some questions as to whether this snow would accumulate on surfaces such as streets and sidewalks. And with temperatures being below freezing right now, there is some light accumulation on those surfaces, nothing major, but if there's a shaded street or sidewalk that's typically not good sunlight and it's not that warm, there'll probably be some slick spots on that, so be careful if you're gonna be heading out soon. Looking at the radar right now, we have the heaviest snowfall right now is in southeast Olathe down toward Payola, stretching up into Jackson County, whereas areas such as Topeka and Oskaloosa are in the clear now. Here in Lawrence, we are almost there. Give it another about half an hour, 45 minutes, and we will be done with the snow. And going hour by hour today, 
The clouds will be a consistent factor along with the strong winds out of the north. We'll be close to a high around 38 this afternoon. But then come this evening, skies will start to clear out and that will allow temperatures to just plummet overnight down toward a low of 17 for early tomorrow morning. So if you're going to be off to an early start for your weekend tomorrow, you're definitely going to want to layer up. But then tomorrow the sun comes back out and then tomorrow and Sunday we warm up nicely. Going to be close to 60 Sunday, won't be surprised if we get a little bit above over that. And as Cole said, we have a stacked sports week coming up. So let's get right into that right now. As KU basketball heads down to Norman to take on Oklahoma tomorrow, it'll be right around 40 for that matchup as the basketball team looks to get their first road win in over a month. Now the baseball team starts their season down in Corpus Christi for four games over the weekend. First three are against Illinois Chicago, and then they wrap up on Monday against the host college. They have a good chance of rain for that game today and tomorrow a non-zero chance as well for that one. Softball team continues their stretch down in Florida. Not quite as nice as it was last week, but much better than 30 degrees and snowfall, I'll say. As they have four games in two days against Big Ten opponents. And then they wrap up Thursday at College Station against UTSA. They have a good chance of rain for both their games tomorrow afternoon. And other KU sports are scattered all across the country for the next week. As we have women's, as we have women's tennis and men's golf will be in California. And women's basketball has games at BYU and at Baylor. Weather looks good for all of those. However, for track and field in Manhattan today, it will be a chilly 37 degrees. Going on to the seven day forecast here. For today, again, the snow will be moving out around the lunch hour before we warm up nicely for the weekend. And I'll continue into next week as we will get close to 70 degrees on Wednesday before once again dropping back down a little bit as we head toward the next weekend. Over to you, Cole. Thanks, Sam, for that weather report. That's my weatherman right there. Thank you so much for tuning in to Good Morning KU Sports today. That's all we have for you, but fortunately, you can tune into Playmakers at noon. And we'll see you next Friday. Rock Chalk, Jayhawk.